Good evening, everyone. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about a political transformation that took place in California during the Civil War time, which is really quite an amazing transformation. And it was done in large part by one extraordinary individual named Thomas Starr King, who was a minister from Boston, a Unitarian minister who came to San Francisco in 1860 and uh, ended up carrying out a completely unique uh, transformation of the population in that crisis period of time. Last week, we talked about two individuals uh, who preceded him and somewhat overlapped him. One was uh, actually, why don't you put uh, put the picture up, Tony. That's the book I wrote called the, the Lincoln Revolution in California. And it's about how this transition took place. The, the, the uh, last week we talked about uh, two of the, the two people on the upper uh, upper left hand corner, David Broderick, who was a Democrat from New York, who came to California in 1849 and spent a, a decade fighting with the pro-slavery faction of the Democratic Party in a rough and tumble battle, a violent battle that ended up in his death. The other one in the middle you see there is Edward Baker, who's a longtime friend of Abraham Lincoln's, who also was in San Francisco in the 1850s into, into uh, 1860. And we talked about him in some depth, and he also was a totally extraordinary individual. The third one we're gonna talk about is on the right, and his name is uh, Thomas Starr King. And um, he is largely credited with keeping California in the union during that period, because whether you know it or not, California was actually in danger of secession when the Southern states were seceding. What you see on the bottom there is a picture of a union rally in San Francisco after the, uh, after the, the beginnings of the war got started. And uh, as you can see, well, you can't probably see, but the signs there say the union, the whole union and nothing but the union. Uh, and, and it was a fight to uh, keep California loyal to the union. So this, this discussion is not really just about California. It's about how the population, the American population and really any population can be elevated and improved and rise to a level of historical necessity if they have the right leadership and the right thinking to do that. So I'm gonna uh, focus on, you can show the other picture if you want, that's a more of a uh, close up of Thomas Starr King. When he, um, he came from Boston in 1860, at which point he was in rather poor health, but he was already uh, famous in Boston to some extent in New England as a minister and a lecturer. And uh, he had traveled around giving uh, many speeches and uh, was widely respected there. Um, and uh, when he came to California, he thought that he was going to build up the church that he had been sent to, uh, to take over and otherwise to go around making lectures like he had done before. Now his lectures in themselves were rather extraordinary on on rather on, on very weighty topics. He, he's, he one of them, for example, was called "Substance and Show." This was one of his most famous ones, where he he disproves the idea that you know anything by sense perception. That what you see or touch or or feel it has nothing to do with reality. And he goes into great depth, and he's very humorous, and and it makes it very accessible to a, a uh, a general population. Another famous one that he did was called Socrates. And uh, this also was an extraordinary speech lecture in which he goes through the life of Socrates, how Socrates uh, intervened in Athens, uh, taking on the, uh, the political elites there, which were known as the sophists and, and, and how he dismantled their whole way of thinking and um, and risked his life in the process of doing that because he was going against the powers that be. He was going against the uh, the powers of Zeus, you might say, 
that were ruling in Athens at the time. And he took his life into his hands to do that and uh, ended up paying the price. And, and, and at the end, uh, Thomas Starr King has a lengthy discussion of the trial of Socrates, of how he faced down his opponents, of how he refused to plea bargain, of how he, uh, he uh, gave them a, a, a beautiful uh, dissertation on, on the immortality of the soul and how it would be, uh, he would be incapable of doing anything less than fighting for the truth. So these kind of speeches, which were affecting the, you know, the audiences wherever he, he spoke, he came and he started doing that in San Francisco and, and continued doing those. But um, in the meantime, what happened is, of course, the, uh, the political situation continued to, uh, to uh, escalate towards the Civil War. Uh, the year that he got there, 1860, it, shortly after he arrived, Lincoln, Lincoln won the uh, the Republican nomination for president, and this set off a, a, a waves of reaction from the, uh, the 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 fanatical side of the Democratic Party. And uh, soon, the Democratic Party met and and at uh, their convention and ended up splitting in two and and. Uh, uh, the you know the political situation just continued to uh, to escalate. Um, in in the fall of that year, uh, Edward Baker, as uh, if you were here last time, you know he was elected to the U.S. Senate from Oregon, and he came back and he made a very powerful intervention, a powerful speech in San Francisco, uh, be right before the election of of Lincoln. Made a couple of speeches like that. Baker was at one of them. I mean. Uh, Thomas Starr King was at the one in San Francisco and was totally thrilled by that because even though he was known as being a, a good speaker, he was uh, he, he saw what Baker was doing as even uh, a level beyond what he was he, he had done before and determined to improve his own uh, methods accordingly. Um, so um, what I'm going to do tonight is mostly talk about the political speeches that Thomas Starr King ended up making, not just speeches, but actual interventions as the situation escalated and unfolded uh, around the buildup to the, to the Civil War. Um, the, uh, because in, in California, there, were, uh, there was a very strong uh, secessionist faction that had a lot of power. And there was actual talk that California would secede if the other states seceded, in, including this was not just talk. I mean, there were senators and congressmen and other top officials that were running around making statements saying that if if uh, if if the southern states seceded, then California should go with it and e either join them in a in a southern confederacy or become a Pacific Republic. And uh, they would be less than men if they didn't do that and things like that. And uh, so it was very real, and they didn't know which way California was going to go uh, in, 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 as this crisis unfolded. Um, so one of the first major interventions that Baker made was, I mean, sorry, Thomas Starr King made was in, uh, was actually on Washington's birthday in 1861. Now Washington's birthday in those days was usually celebrated as a as a big holiday with parades and uh, events and speeches, and uh, so there was a, uh, an event like that in San Francisco, and uh, Thomas Starr King was the featured speaker. the um, The picture that you saw on the cover of the book is from that day. There was the outdoor rally, which is in the picture, and then there was an indoor event that night, which he spoke at. And uh, at this point, seven states had already seceded from, from the Union. This is before, or said they seceded. You know, ne neither Lincoln nor Baker accepted the idea that you could legally secede. So they didn't even say they seceded, but they said they seceded. Um, so seven states had, had gone out, and uh, the country was in a bit of a crisis, was in more than a bit of a crisis. There was a lot of fear and uncertainty. And even though there was celebration over Washington 
and so on. People just did not know what was going to happen or, or where things were going to go. So Thomas Starr King was uh, was the orator of the night at this benefit for the Sumner Light Guard. I, and the title was Washington, Father of His Country. And of course, all I can do is give you a few little excerpts, which will give you a little bit of a sense of how he was thinking and how he was uh, confronting the situation which was going on. And people were uncertain what to do. And he said, we should turn for the refreshment and right guidance of our patriotism to the life and services of not the great Virginian, but the great American, George Washington. And he went through an extensive detail of his life and said that his greatest work was that of organizing the Republic and, and the Constitution. And that through his presidency, he ever put down the spirit of sectionalism, as in the, the Whiskey Rebellion, where he set the example of how to deal with nullification and treason. And then he, you know, towards the end, he contrasted Washington's approach toward that of the president then, James Buchanan. Because don't forget, even though Lincoln had been elected, the president wasn't inaugurated then until March 4th. So here's February 22nd. And in this interim period, James Buchanan and his administration were just completely ma making a mess out of everything with these states uh, declaring secession. And so he says, what would Washington do today with actual and combined secession? Nothing. They, he would have acted four months ago. He would have purged his cabinet of treason because the Buchanan cabinet was full of, of traitors. He would have awed, awed out of it conspirators and thieves. He would not have been a lump of shilly shally incarnate. He would not have ordained a day of fasting and prayer, which is what he did, simply because he was too weak in the knees to stand up to his duty. The rebellion would have been confined to South Carolina. Uh, at, at the idea that Virginia might secede, they hadn't done so yet, King was just aghast. He said, the dust of Washington must belong to the nation, which holds Trenton, Princeton, Monmouth, and Valley Forge. And he says, what? His bones lie quiet in a republic founded on secession, which he hated and trampled down, devoted to the idol worship of slavery, which he desired to abolish, inaugurated by desecration of the flag, which he would have poured out all of his lifeblood to sustain. Would he sleep in peace in a country foreign to all his great battlefields? Would he sleep or would he not rise up in a burst of his terrible wrath from a cemetery over which the stars and stripes would be accounted pollution by his degenerate descendants? So he is not mincing any words and he never does. And he gets more and more emphatic as time goes on. And this speech, by the way, was repeated all over the state. He, he, uh, he went all up and down the mining country and so on. Um, so then Lincoln is inaugurated, and then the next thing that the State Democratic Convention meets in San Francisco, and uh, and they start putting out all these statements saying that we can't preserve the Union by force, that this is just madness, 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 that we have to avoid all provocations and consider the causes of secession and offer guarantees against a recurrence against such causes. In other words, give the secessionists everything they want and hope that they're going to come back. So King responded to that with a with a lecture uh, on April 19th, uh, on the talking about the Battle of Lexington and the new struggle for li liberty. And he takes up the question that the secessionists were claiming that their actions were uh, were a similar or, or the same thing as the colonists declaring independence from Great Britain. So he goes through a lengthy speech discussing why there is nothing at all in common between what the colonists did against Great Britain and what the secessionists are doing against the United States uh, in this situation. Um, and he repeated that speech at different places. Uh, meanwhile, things are, are continuing to unravel. The governor of the state, a man named John Downey, did not attend a, a, a pro-union rally that took place and instead sent a message saying the only means of preserving the American Union is honorable compromise. 
I do not believe that an aggressive war should be waged on any section of the Confederacy, meaning the country, nor do I believe that this union can be preserved by a coercion policy. And then two days later, he wrote a letter saying uh, that he could not support Lincoln's attempt to annihilate half the union, as I cannot but look upon it as insane. So this is uh, very early in the whole in the whole war. Uh, meanwhile, there was a war with the newspapers in the state. There were only seven newspapers that had supported Lincoln. 21 had supported Breckinridge, who was the candidate of the, the extreme uh, Southern slaveocracy. And uh, 24 had, had supported Douglas. And uh, so the secession papers were constantly putting out all this, this rabid propaganda against uh, against Lincoln and the war effort. Um, but even the, the so-called loyal newspapers were were ambi ambivalent about what, what we should be doing. And they're saying things like that, the quarrel is not ours on the West Coast. We have nothing to do with it. We shouldn't take any part of it. The churches were also up in the air. One uh, prominent minister was uh, going around saying prayers to Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. And King wrote a sermon about that called The Great Uprising, uh, which was kind of his own declaration of war, in which he compares the uprising of Satan in heaven to the secessionists in the United States and says maybe he could he could pray for Jefferson Davis as a as a uh, for his soul. But that. Um, but as soon as but as as a president, never. I just as soon uh, pray for the Antichrist. And he ends by saying, God bless the president of the United States and all who serve him with the cause of, of the common country. God grant the blessing of repentance and return to allegiance to all of our enemies, even, in, even the traitors in high places. And, uh, and he, 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 he goes on from there. Uh, after Fort Sumter, he gives another sermon called the Northern Uprising as the attacks are escalating. And uh, He's responding to the attacks on him because because they're all saying, well, a clergyman shouldn't be intervening in politics. He gives a speech about Washington. Well, that's fine to talk about Washington, but he shouldn't use the speech to denigrate part of the country, namely the the uh, the Southerners. And so. Uh, and, and King responds by saying, yeah, I, too, think that. Uh, that. Uh, Ministers should stay out of politics. All they should do is is campaign for the whole country. Is is go for the whole country. Uh, and he says, in these days, a preacher who who does not find the Old and New Testaments urging him to stand up for his whole country and the cause of civilization, must own a Bible that is covered with dead and barren lava, not a living volcano of all noble and sacred truth. So he's emphatic that that ministers absolutely do have a role to play in this situation in saving the country. So he takes a tour throughout the interior of uh, California, going through some really wild and rough places. He got kind of gets a kick out of some of the names like Poker Flat and You Bet and Last Chance and Hangtown, which was later called Placerville, Rich Bar and so on. And he talked to a lot of hostile audiences and he makes this comment at one point where he says, I never knew the exhilaration of public speaking until I faced the front row of revolvers and Bowie knives. And, uh, and another comment about that says, uh, by somebody reporting later, says that effort after effort was made to put him down. Pistols were sometimes leveled, sometimes snapped at him. But the ruffians soon found that he paid little heed. There was no case mentioned in which the orator did not triumph over every element of brutal opposition in the assemblages he addressed. So uh, that was the environment in which he was organizing. The, uh, by July 4th, which was also another big holiday, uh, which people celebrated with huge events and parades and marching bands and all kinds of things, um, by this time, 11 states had dropped out, said they seceded, and a real war mobilization was underway. And some people who claimed to be uh, loyal to the Union still didn't want to fight a war to preserve it. 
And also at this point, the, the, this is when the emancipation issue first came up. And uh, there was violent opposition to that. It came up because they were finding that the, the uh, Union troops were finding that the Southern troops uh, under the Confederacy were utilizing uh, slave labor, the slaves, to to do to work in the army for them. And um, so under that situation, Lincoln said, well, any slaves found in, in, in these areas should be released. So this caused then a huge freak out because there were people that uh, were very opposed to emancipation, not just in the South, but a lot of people uh, around the North and elsewhere uh, did not support that at all. And um, uh, including in California, and uh, there was all kinds of violent reactions from that. Um, and King would intervene at every one of these situations. You know, again, he made a speech, you know, comparing the list of abuses that th these guys were claiming had, had been uh, leveled against the South, comparing that to the actual abuses that were that were uh, that the, the colonists were uh, re rebelling against in 1776. And he talks about one of the uh, leaders of the Confederate Confederacy saying that uh, the uh, the whole idea has changed now, that in 1776, everyone, including in the South, agreed that slavery was a bad thing, that it was uh, a violation of natural law. It was it was wrong in principle and it would uh, some way or other be evanescent and pass away. And he says, our new government says the opposite. We say that the great truth is that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery is his natural and normal condition. So King issues a blistering attack against all this, uh, a, a lengthy speech in which he, he, he concludes that the old declaration of independence will live, the new one will not, the old was drawn by patriots, the new by traitors, the old was written from the sentiments that well up from the pure fountains of civilization. The new was written with the devil's ink in the interests of the most shameless selfishness ever uttered in the literature of state papers. The old was to compact America, the new to rend it. The issue is open. It is for us to take our part. Let us heed the call that comes to the nation in this hour from the heroes of the earlier times. So every one of the, the, the complaints and and arguments that were brought up either by the secessionists or, or their sympathizers, he would come back with a, you know, a, 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 a biting uh, a, a response. Um, and th this would go on th throughout the war because there was issue after issue that came up uh, that, uh, that, 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 that all that had to be addressed at every step of the way. There was wars among the there were new the newspaper wars went on, but you'll you'll see some of that. In the midst of all this, he 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 gives a speech at his church, I mean a sermon, titled The Comet of 1861. And again, I don't have time to to go into all these, and it's it's in the book, and, and maybe we can take it up next time. But he goes through a whole speech about the history of comets and and he, and he said he's glad that at every new temptation to consider in the pulpit and the church the wonder and the laws of modern astronomy and uh, he says let the strange fire, strange fire which burst with beauty on our northern heavens last week and which is now fading swiftly from sight be the means of instructing us more seriously in the wisdom of his providence who telleth the numbers of the stars and calleth them by their names and I'm not doing any justice to that sermon because it was very lengthy, very beautiful, very in-depth, but just to give you an idea of the kind of things that he was doing. So even despite all these crises going on, he still had, he still was not uh, distracted to the point that he, he couldn't see the beauty of what was going on in, in the universe. And so things escalated. By late July, you had the, the disaster at Bull Run, and then you had elections coming up in California, and there were there were three slates. Uh, the, the, you still had these two Democratic slates, and and now you had a Republican slate. And the secessionists were not a majority, but 
they were very zealous and very organized. And people were people who were patriots who were worried that they could win uh, the upper hand in the coming elections. And in fact, there was an there was a situation where the the general in charge was told to send five thousand uh, California troops to Arizona to meet an oncoming uh, column from Texas. And the city leaders in San Francisco protested and sent a letter to the War Department because they said, wait, wait, we can't afford to lose these these troops. And they laid out the situation and they said, a majority of our present state officials are avowed secessionists and the balance being bitterly hostile to the administration, the Lincoln administration, are advocates of a peace policy at any sacrifice. Every appointment made by our governor, John Downey, within the past three months indicates his entire sympathy and cooperation with those plotting to sever California from her allegiance to the Union. About three eighths of our citizens are natives of slaveholding states and are almost a unit in this crisis. The hatred manifested so pointedly in the South and so strongly evinced on the battlefield is no more intense there than here. And they say our advices obtained with great prudence and care show us that there are about 16,000 Knights of the Golden Circle in this state and that they are still organizing even in our most loyal districts. So just reading that, so give you the situation, give you a picture of the, the environment that existed and uh, and what what was, uh, what the, you know, it, people don't think usually that California had anything to do with the Civil War or, or any of the problems around that, but this was not the case. So um, just before the election, uh, King came out with a new speech called Peace and What It Would Cost Us. And this is uh, because of the fact that the uh, one of the leading candidates for governor, the secessionist, pro-secession candidate named John McConnell, who was from Kentucky, actually, uh, was going around making speeches about war and how much it would cost us and that we should stop fighting this war because it's going to cost too much. So King takes on a devastating attack against that. And he says, why are we, first of all, why are we even talking about this? We had peace before the election. The election was peaceful. There was no charges of, of fraud or violence or anything. Um, and time and again, presidents had been elected devoting to Southern theories and interests. And it would seem that the rebel leaders would have submitted to one Northern administration at least to prove that they were not vile gamblers who were willing to play as long as they could throw loaded dice that would turn up sixes, but would overthrow the tables and draw revolvers as soon as an honest cast, which carried one stake against them, was made. And he goes on, a cry of peace from filibusters. These are the people that ran these filibustering operations to take over Mexico and, and Central America and impose slave states there. These are the people that wanted to spend tons of money, $200 million to, to buy Cuba or, or have a war with Spain to get Cuba and make it into a slave state. These are the people that are running around talking about, about peace and talking about we, we can't spend too much money. And... Uh, and he, 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 uh, he says, uh, as heavy as, then they, they were also making the, the, uh, the case about, uh, about separate states and so on. And uh, he, he has gone through a, a whole ser series of arguments about why the um, state sovereignty was a complete failure through with the, with the Articles of Confederation. And... Um, at that time, he said, we were a poor, despised, contemptible, bankrupt, disintegrating people. In spite of our rich resources and noble domain, we had only life enough to be conscious of dying. At the end of the Articles of Confederation, that is, you know, between the end of the revolution and the adopting of the Constitution. And he said, heavy as the revolutionary debt was, the Constitution lifted it, floated it, and melted it away in a few years by the prosperity it poured like magic over the land. And now it is cheaper to fight to restore the constitution over our whole domain than to make peace and see half the country torn from it. And then he makes this comment later on in the speech, which, which they all freaked out about. He says, I know ministers who, if they have not muscle enough to hold a musket and do not measure enough around the waist to be mustered into service, I think he's talking about himself, 
would be willing to load revolvers for troops and tear up their Bibles for wadding. If we would have peace in the state, we must show a strong front of union loyalty. We must turn a, an ear stone deaf to insidious treason. We must, we, we must look to our powder and not what it costs. So that's, again, just a small fr fragment of a, of a very long speech, which was then reprinted and uh, published in, in newspapers and broadsheets and distributed all over the state. And this is right before the election. And the election turned out to be a big victory for the Republicans for the first time, where uh, a Republican was elected uh, governor and uh, with with 46 percent against the two Democrats, each getting 28 and 26 percent. So at that point, the danger of actual secession was pretty much, uh, you know, not existent anymore. I mean, the um, it was a resounding defeat for the secessionist party, but they were not going away and they were going to continue with various, uh, with, with every kind of operation they could, they could think of and including their control of the, the news media. I mean, the media was not totally controlled like it is now. I mean, there was, there was secessionist papers and loyal papers and various shadings thereof, but uh, the secessionists were just rabid. So in response to that speech of King's, one of them had this uh, article saying, a model minister, Reverend T. Star King delivered an abolition speech in San Francisco on Thursday evening of last week, from which we take the following disgraceful sentence. And they quote him saying, and I know ministers who, if they have not the muscle to hold a musket, or if they did not measure enough around to pass muster, would be willing to load revolvers for soldiers to fire, and would tear up their Bibles for wadding. That tear up the Bibles for wadding is in capital letters. And they say, the author of a sentiment so atrocious cannot be a sincere follower of Christ. He has mistaken his mission, or rather has stolen the livery of heaven to serve the devil in. Christ taught peace and goodwill to men. Reverend T. Star King, hypocritically professing to be his follower, calls, as the persecutors of Christ did, for blood. So this was uh, what he was going to be showered with for the next couple of years, constantly. Um, he then, you know, takes time out to, to speak to the Mechanics Institute. And he gives a beautiful speech called The Nobleness of the Mechanic Arts, uh, which, again, I can't even begin to, to summarize here. Uh, he, he talks about the... Um, the idea that of, of people standing on the near side of the moon and what it would look, what the earth, how beautiful the earth would look like from that perspective. And he says, but then when you get closer, you realize it's, it's a place for hard toil. And he says that the, um, uh, he says the first thought which might, uh, must arrest us and hold us in this regard is that the world itself was made by the creator as a field chiefly for the display and advance of the mechanic arts and for the education of man through the exercise and improvement of them. Uh, he says, the mastery of the earth is the chief command and trust which the Almighty has committed to mortals here. It is this command which ennobles labor and places the mechanic arts through which alone the mastery of the earth is gained in their central position as expressions of human power and symbols of human duty. And he goes on about this and then he ends up coming back to the patriotic theme. He says, our national struggle is not just for the capital and the old geography and the constitution, it's also for the dignity of labor. The daggers of conspiracy strike at that through the rent constitution, through the holes in the declaration of independence, which they scorn, the traitors seek to stab the doctrine of, of the humanity and rights of classes everywhere that toil. And he says, at, at, if need be, you're going to throw down the hammer and take up the sword and says, let the crime against labor be avenged. So this is um, this is what he was doing. By by um, by October, uh, October twenty first actually was a day that started with great celebration because the transcontinental telegraph was finally completed that day. Uh, otherwise, communication with the east was 
Pony Express for a couple of years and worse before that. So, uh, but the problem is this, the second message of the day was that of the disaster at Ball's Bluff and the death of Edward Baker. And uh, it was after that, that, uh, that, that Baker, that uh, Thomas Starr King realized he, he had a lot of work to do. I mean, everybody kind of realized at that point in California that the, that the war was real, that it was not going away. It was not going to be short. It was not going to be easy. Uh, and this kind of hit people over the head. So, uh, and King started uh, doing, he, he was, he had always been a, a fundraiser for, for different causes and, and would have a lot of fun doing it. And he started taking up a collection for the National Fund, which was kind of like a war bonds thing where they were getting people to invest uh, to, to help the war effort. And um, so he made a speech called Investments. He talks about what's worth investing in. And uh, he's very pointed about it. He says, the man that would refuse to subscribe to the loan because he could get elsewhere a higher percentage, this is a report in the paper, was humiliated and told he should send a few drops of his blood to be analyzed by a chemist, that it might be seen whether its chief element was water, milk, milk and water, or dishwater. And when, when this remark was made, somebody in the back jumped up and said, I'll go $25 on it. And everyone laughed and applauded. And, and uh, King says, that, that man has red-blooded American blood in his veins. And uh, in this, he, he also gives, pays a, a, a tribute to Baker at, at this time and, and his, uh, his greatness. And he, he also would be the speaker, the, the eulogist at Baker's funeral when his body was returned a couple weeks later. But it was also about this time that King started directing funds that he was raising toward a thing called the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which was a new organization that had come into being as a necessity for the war. I mean, when the war started, the U.S. Army had 26 doctors and one surgeon general, and they had no way they had no idea how they were going to deal with all these casualties that started coming in. So this, uh, so Congress put through legislation, Lincoln signed it, creating the U.S. Sanitary Commission, which is usually described as a forerunner to the Red Cross. There was volunteers that would go to the battlefields that would take care of the, the, the sick and the wounded and um, do whatever was necessary, sewing uh, hospital gowns. And, and, you know, a lot of women were involved in that and so on. And, and it was started by a friend of Kings, a guy, a, a minister in New York named Henry Bellows, who was kind of a mentor of King and a long friend also uh, with the Unitarian Church. And uh, he was the first, uh, he was the president of it and, and, and the organizer of it. And uh, so um, uh, you'll hear more about that a little bit later. Um, in in uh, in 1862, which came after he got a little bit of a break because that was the year of the great floods and nobody could go anywhere. That's when uh, the whole Central Valley was under 40 feet of water. But then in June, uh, he spoke to the College of Oakland. It was uh, the end of the year class uh, in which he talked about the intellectual duties of students in their academic years. He starts by saying there is no intellectual pleasure more sweet than the assurance tested in arduous labor of being grounded in truth, the finding that you have built your house on a rock, than the repose that comes when you know something positively and know that you know it and feel the mastery of a practical field because of that consciousness. And he goes on for quite quite some time along that, that line. And... Um, in concluding, he says, make the history of your land part of your mental substance. Resolve that every year shall introduce you to some new department or treasure of it. Make some noble biography every year more familiar to your heart. In this way, the scholars of the country can contribute more than tons of powder, more than sheaves of steel, more than bomb-proof forts, a fleet of monitors, and so on to the defense of the Republic. They contribute power, the very core of power, inspiration to the character of the land, energy that will use the material forces to some noble purpose. So that's the way students were supposed to think in those days. 
at least according to the way he looked at it. Um, you can imagine how students, I mean, how they think about that today. But again, it's he's, he's speaking at a student ceremony, but he, he brings in the reality of what's going on in the world and, and their, uh, their relevance to it. Um, and it goes on. The, uh, he, he taught, you know, well, I'm going to skip some of that. The, uh, it, it, by, you know, middle of 1862, there had been a lot of union defeats. Lincoln called out 300,000 more volunteers. And at this point, you had the, the emergence of a new group called the Copperheads, which was not that new. It was just a conglomeration of some of the previous uh, uh, detractors from the war effort and uh, people that were determined to uh, stop the war, to, to just let this, the, the uh, Confederacy do whatever they wanted to do and, um, and to end the fighting. And uh, including you had in California, a guy named uh, Milton Latham, who was the senator, who was running around the state, stumping for the Democratic slate and viciously attacking the administration and the war effort. Even though he said he was for the union, he's going around saying the original object of the war had been abandoned. It's now being prosecuted only for emancipation. There's all the violations of the constitution that are being carried out by the administration. And uh, this is what was going on. So um, in response to, to the election and to also more uh, military defeats, the second bull run and so on, uh, King wrote a new speech called the New Call of Patriotism in which he attacks uh, the pessimism that was setting in because of these defeats. He said, we are summoned to a new exhibition of patriotism we will have to suffer more on behalf of the country. We must be prepared to say that we will. And then he takes up another issue, which uh, which they were all uh, worked up about. The new call of patriotism bids us conquer the neuralgia and hysteria which have been excited whenever rebels have thrown out the word abolition. Thousands of men would rather would would sooner face a rebel battery than those syllables hissed out by abettors of treason. And he takes that on uh, and says, it's it's time to end this nonsense. Uh, and then he, he, he focuses on the Confederate sympathizers in the North and he's ruthless with them. He says, can any creature be so despicable now on the globe as a secessionist in a loyal state? Yet what a forlorn creature he is. Ought we not rather to pity him he has no country. He can't open a book on American biography or history and feel pride in it. Every bright page of it condemns him. He's cut himself off from the heritage of his country's memories, from his dividend of honor and the fame of Washington and his supporting staff of patriots who saved their country by their valor and built a grander polity in it by their genius and, and the help of God. A secessionist in a northern, northern state is an orphan, forlorn and pitiable. And he says, no, he is despicable, rather. He has not the manliness to go fight for the flag and hopes that he hopes will triumph. He stays and nourishes his wretched breath where, where it is safe. He stays under the flag he hates, which generously protects him to plot against it by undermining patriotism. He is a perpetual spy, cunning and cowardly. He measures accurately the pressure and fervor of the public sentiment and talks against the government that blesses him just to the limit of serious peril. His face is just prudently radiant when news of disaster comes. So he uh, was not at all afraid to say the truth. Uh, and, and then he, he was ripping to shreds this, this Senator Milton Latham uh, at length. Um, anyway, the uh, at the polls, the Democrats were slaughtered. The Republicans won, actually, um, by this time, they had a union ticket. They, they finally united the pro-union Democrats and the Republicans and had a union party. But also at this election, 
there was uh, they they started King had put out the idea of putting uh, contribution boxes for the sanitary fund at the ballot boxes. Uh, and they did that and they raised three thousand dollars. And this was just the beginning of a major fundraising effort for that project. He then speaks to the San Joaquin Valley Agricultural Society. I'm running out of time, but it's a beautiful speech. He compares farmers to God the creator, extending God's work. He, he also points out that um, it, took, it took a hunter 800 acres to produce the same uh, amount of food that a farmer produces on a half an acre under cultivation. And, and he says that um, on the 800 acre system, society is impossible, education is impossible, trades and arts are out of the question, combinations of power and interchange of products and help are unattainable. Uh, just in proportion as the land is better tilled and a smaller quantity is made to yield rich returns, the progress of the race is aided and becomes manifest. And then he, he itemizes hundreds of crops that are going to be produced there in the next hundred years in that valley. So he never stops. He never he, and he never gets he never loses sight of the real uh, the real thing that 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 has that that is supposed to be done. Uh, but then he continues. The, he, he from there he escalates the effort to raise funds for the sanitary commission. There was a big event in in San Francisco for that purpose. Six thousand people attended in mid September of eighteen sixty two. This is several prominent politicians politicians spoke. They all gave good speeches for the union cause. King praised the speakers and uh, but then proceeded to put people on the spot. He said. Uh, Look, you're you're not on the front lines here. No blood has been shed here, uh, and we've only raised five thousand dollars so far for the relief fund. And meanwhile, we've made profits from the gold shipments and things like that. Um, he says the you know it's a loyal city. There were only two hundred and sixty-seven secession votes last election, but as to intensity of action, we are not yet in tune to the choir of our fellow brethren in the east. We must first get up to the concert pitch. And he turns to the, there were 70 vice presidents that had been appointed for this event. And he says, he looks to them and says, every one of them, of course, will expect to give a thousand dollars. See how happy they look. And then he, he calls out these uh, companies, these businesses one by one, name this one can afford to give this much, that one can afford to give that much. We'll expect this from that one. He names the different nationalities and so on. So anyway, this whole thing builds up, and within five days, they had raised one hundred and six thousand dollars. And uh, people that refused to to contribute were called out as prosperous merchants. They give stories of of the people that were the relatively poor they, that made different contributions. There was a headline in the New York Times, September twenty third, that said one hundred thousand dollars for the relief of the sick and wounded, and reported that reported on the astounding munificence of San Francisco, because up to that time, only 170,000 had been raised nationally. Uh, there was another event a few weeks later in San Francisco, which uh, he made a speech called The Privilege and Duties of American Patriotism, in which he basically says, it's time to free the slaves now. And he talks about patriotism as a sentiment, and American patriotism especially. He goes through the history of patriotism in different countries and, and, and says, but what is it what is it different about being an American patriot? Where we're not just uh, patriotic because of family ties or great heroes or language or culture, but this is a unique country based on the principle of, of, uh, of self-government. And therefore American patriotism is even more uh, is even more of a higher level than patriotism in general. And then he says that the uh, we have to. It's time to call for a new declaration of policy. That we um, and he says the slave oligarchy of the rebel states. If the war is to end in our favor, it must be shorn of their power for mischief. Uh, in the now rebellious states, there are less than three hundred thousand slave owners. We must crush their power. 
And to crush the power, we must strike the fetters from the bondsmen. And we must say soon that that is our purpose, that our purpose is nothing less than that. And he ends with, a, with an appeal saying, oh, that the president would soon speak that electric sentence, inspiration to the loyal North, doomed to the traitorous aristocracy whose cup of guilt is full. Let him say that it is a war of mass against class, of America against feudalism, of the schoolmaster against the slave master, of workmen against the barons, and uh, of the ballot box against the barracoon. This is what the struggle means. Proclaim it so, and what a light breaks through our leaden sky. The war wave rolls, rolls then with the impetus and weight of an idea. Yes, gentlemen, then heaven will bless the sword. Now this was on September 22nd, 1862, and he did not know that Lincoln that day was signing the, uh, the, original, dra the original Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Anyway, by October 1st, another 100,000 was raised in this process and a real steamroller was underway. The, uh, the next issue that came up was the, the issue of uh, ballot uh, of voting for the, uh, for the soldiers. There were a million soldiers in the field in various states far from home. And the issue came up, well, they, they have to be able to vote because, you know, I mean, these are all patriotic voters. So states started passing laws, figuring out how they could do that. And then there was being uh, was suggested there be a congressional act. So the copperheads were all freaking out about that. Congress should have nothing to do with voting laws. This is treason and so on. And um, King made a speech in which he called on for ballot, ballot boxes to be distributed to the battlefields and made a comment that Congress should enact laws and drive through the Constitution to do it. So then these newspapers are all freaking out. Thomas Starr King is saying, this clerical charlatan hypocrite and double distilled humbug is still repeating his threadbare lecture on patriotism. After his disgraceful conduct in connection with monies for the patriotic fund and his wanton advice to drive through the constitution, his lips should be sealed forever on the subject. Starr King is a fair representative a uh, representative man of the rabid, fanatical, godless Boston school of political preachers. Their cry is now, nigger, nigger, blood, blood. The peace doctrines of the meek and lowly Jesus who taught peace on earth and goodwill to men are scouted as treasonable by these fanatical mountebanks of the clerical school. So they were rather unhinged. And uh, one of the other newspapers responded to that actually one of the patriotic newspapers saying, uh, what's this about the meek and lowly Jesus? Wasn't he the one that drove the devil and all his Confederate traitors to hell? And there was no cry for peace until the war had been so ended. So uh, this, is, this is what was going on and uh, we're kind of running out of time here, uh, but I'll say a few more things. Uh, anyway, in, in 18, 1863, things were changing. The, uh, the legislature that had been elected now consisted of 95 unionists and 11 secessionist Democrats and a Republican governor. Uh, and they passed union resolutions. They elected a pro-union uh, senator named John Connors, who actually had been a friend of Broderick's and was on, the, was on that slate in 1859. Uh, running for governor, I think. Um, but he was now elected as a union man. He was very anti-slavery, and he said that that was the reason that he got into politics in the first place. That was his main issue. And he became a strong ally of Lincoln's, and he was a pallbearer at Lincoln's funeral. Um, there were still more plots going on. There were plots to steal, steal boats and commandeer gold shipments and things like that. Um, The, uh, I'm just gonna say something about July 4th of 1863. This was also a time of very uh, uncertain uh, situation. There, that uh, the battle of Gettysburg was going on. They did not know the, the result of it. They, um, there were huge casualties being uh, reported. 
and Thomas Clark King is making a speech at the July 4th event. And, uh, you know, while there was kind of the usual parades and celebrations, King got up there and said, fellow citizens, never since the early days of the revolution has the 4th of July so serious as this one dawned on the American people. At peace with the world, we are at war with our own within our own boundaries. The wise among us are so are so absolved with the duties of the present bitter hours that they are not in sympathy with the rejoicing and jubilee to which this anniversary has always been yielded, and they feel that that enthusiasm and joy are justified today only for the sake of the stimulant that may thus be supplied for the discharge of duty. And he goes on, you know, he talks and he says, is, is this republic going to survive? This is the question to be to be decided now. And um, and says, uh, you know, and shall, he also takes up the question of black regiments, which was now the latest hot button issue that black regiments were being recruited and some of these uh, the copperhead types were freaking out about that. And uh, he says, and, and shall the rebels wipe out the tremendous word America and in the name of piety and heaven's blessing become the architect of a disappointment and disaster beyond what the sad history of our race has ever known? Uh, no, gentlemen, shall we not see that our trials are rather the proofs to which the creator puts us to test our worthiness to receive and maintain such a blessing as our area and our polity may become? Our duty is to maintain American nationality. I believe, as devoutly as I bow to the Sermon on the Mount, that God summons us to bend each corporal agent and all the fibers of the soul to the work now. If we are not dead to the call of a long compacted and holy trust, we shall confess that we have one great duty, one supreme privilege rather in these terrible days, namely to devote all that we have and are and hope to be to the maintenance of the nation which God has delivered in its fresh magnificence to the keeping of our valor and patriotism. And he goes on, we will know no faltering until our resources and uh, of sacred aggression or resistance are drained. And uh, uh, and so on. He praises, you know, anyway. the um, So it was a hard hitting, it, it was a somber speech. The next day, the news arrived of the victories that had taken place at Gettysburg. And this was when the Confederacy had invaded the North and nobody knew what was going to happen next. So they were defeated at Gettysburg and Bergen driven back. Um, well, I'll just go on for a couple more minutes. Um, there was another election. Now it's uh, September of 1863. They had elections in September at that time in California. Uh, there was the Copperhead Convention denouncing the Lincoln administration for a usurpation of power, disregarding states' rights, the fanatical attempt to place the Negro on the social and political equality with the white race, the Emancipation Proclamation, and the use of paper currency, and calling to restore the Union as it was. However, they thought that was ever going to happen. And... Um, And so, and, and so the uh, the the uh, king's choice for for governor was elected a guy named Frederick Lowe, who was also a member of his congregation. Actually, the for the three years, the leading candidate in the state who then got elected was a member of King's congregation. So he was kind of like this uh, power broker in a way. Um, he was running against the, the hard-headed copperhead John Downey, uh, who came back and uh, won with with sixty percent of the vote, and all the other offices similarly. Um, and the the fundraising continued. Uh, there was a big fundraiser for the Sanitary Commission. There was a a report read of the uh, from somebody who was at the Battle of Antietam. One of the one of the volunteers for the Sanitary Commission, who actually had lived in San Francisco, wrote a lengthy letter to 
King, which he then read to this event. And it was a real tearjerker kind of letter about the conditions on the on the battlefield and the response they were getting and the response to the fact that they had this, they were able to offer them some food and 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 uh, and and help. And um after after King read this, there were thunderous cheers. And King wrote later, people knew their applause would cost them gold and they didn't hold back. He said, I could feel the first beat of San Francisco. Now, Henry Bellows, the, the minister who was in charge of the uh, Sanitary Commission, this, this friend of uh, King's, had asked for 25 to 30,000. And by the end of the year, nearly 200,000 more had been, been raised or pledged. And Bellows sent a telegraph saying, I can only stutter. Noble, tender, faithful San Francisco, city of the heart, commercial and moral capital of the most humane and generous state in the world. Uh, that was San Francisco. And uh, over three years, actually, oh, well over a million dollars was raised in California, 1.2 million. Uh, state, you know, that was about a quarter of all the money that was raised nationally for for the fund and you know california at that point had like one percent of the population so they did meet the meet the uh, emergency in in that way as well as some others so i'm going to stop there and uh see if there's any questions or comments <laughs>